Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Jim and Kristen and everyone at the Target Cancer Foundation for having me here today and for including the patient voice in the, agen in the agenda. Um, I was named zebracorn by my first doctor who diagnosed me with ocular melanoma because as you'll hear my story, you'll see that I tend to be the outlier. And we all know in the medical community, you treat the horse, not the zebra. But one day he said to me, you're like a unicorn zebra. <laughs> you're like a zebracorn. <laughs> um, because I continue to be in this 1% to 2% margin. So hold on. Let me figure out how to do this. I'll just go the old. There we go. Um, so I like to joke that I am the poster child of clinical trials, not to brag. Um, and obviously, Kristen and Jim saw my story in the HuffPost, and I will have a link at the end of my slides where you can access that article. Um, when you're diagnosed with a rare cancer, really any cancer, there's, there's no handbook, there's no how-to guide on fighting for your life, which is why I share my story and I try to take what I've learned and make it easier for the next person. And when I learned about um, Target Cancer Foundation and the work that you are all doing, it really resonated. And, and as you hear my story, you'll understand why. So to me, clinical trials e equal hope. And it's something that all cancer patients are just clinging for, too. Um, so thank you to all of you for the work that you're doing for my community. I really appreciate it. I was first diagnosed um, with a rare form of melanoma called ocular melanoma. When I was 31 years old, this was 10 years ago, um, it affects six in a million people. And I underwent a week of radiation plaque therapy. And from the day I was diagnosed to the day that I finished my therapy, it was 22 days. I lost all vision in my left eye. And a couple of months later, I got the incredible news that I was a 1A. So they tested my cells when they did the procedure and it came back best case scenario. I was told there was a less than 2% chance that it would metastasize. Um, but everybody <laughs> knows someone needs to fall into the 2%. A couple of months later, um, I met this really cute guy named Nick and we quickly fell in love. And after monitoring my eye for about a year, Dr. Hovland, the doctor who diagnosed me said, even though you're this 1A, I, I just wanna, just to be safe, make sure that we're keeping an eye on your liver because if it does spread, it tends to go to the liver. And so I had my first liver ultrasound in April of 2014, sorry. And um, six months, seven months later in November of 2014, I had my second liver ultrasound and we expected it to be fine. Um, Nick and I had just celebrated one year of dating and the afternoon of my ultrasound, I was meeting with the client in Denver and my phone kept going off in my pocket and I got to my car and I listened to a voicemail and I had a voicemail from the oncologist herself. And that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> um, I called her back right away. I was panting and she said, Katie, we found 12 plus suspicious lesions on your liver today. And it's likely that you have fallen into this 2% category. And so I talk about statistics a lot. Um, I also nearly failed statistics in college. <laughs> um, because like I said earlier, somebody has to fall into that 2% category. And so there I was. And this has happened to me time and time again. And sometimes it's been on the bad side, like in this instance. And in other ways, it's been on the good side. So the doctor wanted to do a biopsy right away. It was the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, and my agent was on a plane on Thanksgiving morning so he could be with me the following morning when I had my liver ultras or when I had my biopsy to confirm with what we were dealing with. So this is my agent. My agent is my dad. I always get emotional on this slide, and when I heard about TCF and the work that is being done, I thought, oh my gosh, everybody can have their own Jim Ortman. Um, my dad is a doctor of internal medicine in Omaha, Nebraska, and I can confidently say that if it weren't for him, I wouldn't be standing here today. In addition to my doctor father, my stepmom is a retired CRNA, my sister-in-law is a CRNA, and my sister is a GI nurse. 
So this has been just a massive advantage to me in my fight against cancer. Um, so my dad flies in the morning of Thanksgiving, and what I don't know is that's happening behind the scenes is that really cute guy from slide three um, had been planning for weeks to propose to me on Thanksgiving Day. And so my sisters are texting him, and they said, you know, we really think you should just postpone this. Like, let's get through the biopsy. Let's see what, what we're dealing with. And his response was, it doesn't change anything. She's still the girl I want to marry. So for the record, I hit the husband jackpot. <laughs> and I experienced my first what I would come to call hashtag cancer perk on this day when my dad got to witness this incredible moment in my life. This was hands down the most emotional day I have ever experienced. I, I woke up this morning in the fetal position unsure of how I was gonna peel myself off that bed to face my family and friends. And I went to bed that day like giddy, like a schoolgirl with excitement. And in my mind, I was thinking, am I planning a funeral or am I planning a wedding? Am I wearing black or am I wearing white? The biopsy the next day showed that it was melanoma and so I was confirmed to have stage four incurable cancer. Now I knew that you could be a stage five clinger. And so I thought, well, maybe I could be a stage five cancer patient. So maybe this isn't the worst case scenario. And I Googled the stages of cancer and I learned that yes, in fact, I was dealing with the worst case scenario. So doctor, the doctor who diagnosed me, I like to call her Dr. Doom. She, um, I met with her and my dad and, and my sisters and my fiance, and she said, there's only one FDA approved option for you, Katie, and we'll get you started on that right away. And that might buy you another 16 months of life. My dad was in the room, he heard 16 months, my sister heard six months. Nick and I have no recollection of this conversation, thank God. <laughs> I only learned about this a couple of years ago. But that's another thing I talk about with newly diagnosed patients is you bring a notebook, you bring a note taker, and you record because it's information overload, even for the medical professionals in the room who might be there with you. It's so hard to absorb all of this information. So my dad asked Dr. Doom, well, what about clinical trials? To which she replied, that would be very expensive. So she had already written me off as dead. Um, she underestimated me. And she also didn't know my why. And I think it's important to understand that every patient has a why. They have a reason that they're fighting. And Paul talks about this in, on the blog um, on TCF's web, website. Um, so in addition to Nick and my dad and my siblings, I had these guys. I am the fun aunt. And um, these kiddos have grown in numbers um, and height. Two of them tower over me now <laughs> since this picture was taken. And my biggest fear was leaving them behind and teaching them what grief is. Because I know what grief is for a child. I lost my mom to pancreatic cancer when I was 15 years old. My dad was her caregiver and then here he was doing it all over again for me. So while Nick and I distracted ourselves by moving in together and talking about this, this wedding, my dad spent every waking moment on the phone with doctors from California to New York trying to find an option that found us, that gave us more hope than 16 months. So here are my stats for the next seven years, and I will um, show you the treatments that I had uh, because I know that as medical professionals and scientists and researchers, you might be able to pronounce them. I will not make any attempt to pronounce them. <laughs> um, but all in all, we explored about eight different clinical trials. I enrolled in four, um, and I was expelled. Those are my words, not my doctors, <laughs> from three. Um, and treatments were at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York, UC Health in Denver, and UPMC in Pittsburgh. And I calculate that I spent well over $35,000 out of pocket on travel and lodging. And this is something that is entirely intangible for a lot of people. 
Um, in December of 2014, my dad got me an appointment uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. And so I called and I canceled my appointment with Dr. Doom. And I never heard from her again, although she did recently hear from me because I finally got around to writing her review. <laughs> So um, Dr. Pesto is the doctor I saw at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and he was so great at speaking to me and Nick as the non-medical people that we are, even if my agent was sitting there in the room with us. When you're, if you're not a can or if you're not a medical professional, you don't know basic things like systemic versus targeted treatment, trials versus FDA. And the biggest thing that we learned from Dr. Pesto was the importance of considering treatment options in, down the road. And so he taught us to always have a plan B and to always have a plan C. And what that meant was that he knew that I wasn't going to finish my treatment there. And so he was talking about my case with doctors all over the country to figure out when Katie progresses, what do we do next? I have a friend whose husband was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And she told me that the first doctor frantically told them they had to start chemotherapy right away. And then when they finally had a minute to take a beat and explore clinical trials, he learned that he was not eligible for any of them because he had already started chemotherapy. Um, and so this approach has been crucial to my survival and it's something that we've carried forward after we left Memorial Sloan Kettering. I was, take, I was in the trial at MSK for about eight months. Um, Trametinib, it took me eight months to learn how to say that word. I never did figure out how to say the second word. Um, but when I was eliminated from that trial, we had some options available. So my second and third clinical trials, thankfully, I was able to do closer to home at UC Health in Denver. And the first one was short-lived. I developed colitis and was immediately put on steroids and taken off the trial. And one of the plan B, plan C options that we had been talking about was uh, Y90 or a liver embolization. And it was only FDA approved for metastatic colon cancer. And so when we met with a doctor to explore that when I was eliminated from the second clinical trial, he said to me, Katie, if you're in a lot of pain, we can get this approved. Are you in a lot of pain, Katie? And I like grabbed my left side and I'm like, I don't even know where my liver is. Like, this is how much I don't know about science and <laughs> biology. Um, but we got it approved. And so I had that treatment in November of 2015. And they only treated half of my liver. So they wanted to leave the other half untreated so we would have a baseline for future systemic treatments. And I had a six month break in treatment after having my first embolization and I got my first good scan and this, this card you see from my nephew Tommy, if you don't read six, six year old speak, um, it says, I am excited about your scans, <laughs> which is so sweet. I actually just found this like two weeks ago. Um, and so after six months, we saw growth in the untreated side of my liver and so I started my third clinical trial also at UC Health. And um, this time I had my first form of chemo, and so I lost my hair for the first time. Um, three, I was in that trial for three months, and we saw growth after that, and I was responding so well to the Y90. I mean, tumors were shrinking, some were disappearing, that the doctor said, go back and treat the rest of your liver. And so in September of 2016, I had my second Y90. And it was all around this time that I totally pulled the cancer card to get a dog. <laughs> and what I didn't tell my husband until only recently was that I wanted him to have a reason to get out of bed if something were to happen to me. And so this is our dog tour, Alice. And um, it's making plans and continuing to live your life. That's something that I, I, I talk about with other cancer patients. It's so important to always have something to look forward to. We all learned with COVID that plans will get canceled, um, but Nick and I, we got married, we got a dog, we thought it was a great idea to build a house in the middle of all of that. And um, it's really, it's not worth fighting if we have nothing to fight for or to live for. And so this has been something that has been crucial for us in how we, um, we make plans and how we look to the future. Um, so 20, Bear with me for a second. There we go. 
Um, so 2017 was this banner year for us. Uh, I had no treatment apart from a cataract surgery. I had developed a cataract in my se in my left eye. Um, and they ended up not putting a lens back on there because I am blind. And the dead tumor particles came through the iris and changed my eye from blue to brown. I think Dr. Hovland thought I was going to sue him. But I said, don't you worry. They, wait. I can't go back to get, there we go. They say you start to look like your dog. <laughs> so now Alice and I have matching eyes, which is pretty fun. Um, so Y90 was keeping things at bay. And um, Nick and I finally in 2017 were able to take our honeymoon. We went skydiving. I had a chance to finally explore other things besides treatment. And so I discovered a, a nonprofit called First Descents that provides the healing power of adventure to young adults impacted by cancer. And I went on a week-long kayaking trip with them. They do also have a healthcare worker program available, and Nick has gone on one of their programs as a caregiver. And then 2018 happened. And let me tell you, I wish that the worst thing happening to me in 2018 was the fact that I was growing my hair out after chemo, because if anyone has ever grown their hair out before, they know that that's just pretty awkward and uncomfortable. <laughs> But on top of that, um, I had emergency gallbladder removal in February, less than two weeks um, before Nick had a scheduled hip surgery. And after um, my gallbladder was removed, I started getting really bad ocular migraines. And then one morning I woke up and I presented with stroke-like symptoms. So we had a brain MRI in May and we learned that I had an alleged brain tumor in my left pons because I know exactly where that is. <laughs> And so because of Gamma Knife, we, which was happening a week later, um, we had to cancel a trip to England. We were trying to get back to England because Nick's dad was dying of lung cancer. We had Gamma Knife. We got back to England. And then the day after we returned home, Nick's father passed away. Um, also that day, I started developing a really bad eye infection in my seeing eye because that's rare. So, of course, it would happen to me. And I woke up the following morning and I couldn't see anything. And it was easily probably the most terrifying moment in our marriage, um, going through this and being suddenly fully blind. Thankfully, my, my vision returned. Uh, it was a corneal ulcer. And as soon as my vision came back, we were back on a plane to go back to England so that Nick could give a eulogy at his father's funeral. Um, but thankfully, through all of this, my liver is still remaining stable. Until May of 2020, when a scan showed that the tumors were growing and they were very active, very on brand with 2020. <laughs> so we'd heard of TIL therapy, which stands for tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And what's ironic about this treatment is that when my mom was dying of pancreatic cancer, she was supposed to fly to California to get something that was very similar to till. And so my dad had kind of always seen it as this last ditch effort. And it's something that had been a plan C for a really long time and we decided it was time to explore it and that it was a good option. Um, UPMC uh, Pittsburgh is, is running this trial and Dr. Kamula is the doctor that I see there and I am still in his care. Um, and he has this incredible seven page PDF that is patient centric. And it explains the therapy in a way that the 50-page prototype just doesn't work for normal people. <laughs> um, and I have taken this TIL guide and I have emailed it to family and friends so they can understand what treatment I'm getting. And I have shared it with probably three dozen uh, ocular melanoma patients all over the world who reach out to me and say, what is it that you've had done? They also have a video that goes along with this. Um, I don't know if... Everyone knows what TIL is, um, so I won't go into a whole lot of detail, but it is very labor intensive. So in July of 2020, they laparoscopically removed a couple of tumors from my liver, and then we waited to see if I could grow the TIL. And about two weeks later, I got a phone call from Dr. Kamula, and he said, you grew TIL like crazy right out of the gates. We're moving forward. So in August, I went back to Pittsburgh, and re remember, this is in the middle of a global pandemic. I went back to Pittsburgh and I had uh, leukapheresis. They then fed my white blood cells to the till, multiplying it from the millions to the billions. And while I was there in August, 
One of Dr. Kamula's nurses said to me, Dr. Kamula is tending to your cells like his little babies. And I just loved that. <laughs> um, and so in September of 2020, Nick and I flew to Pittsburgh. We got an Airbnb for Nick. We found a local chef to make him meals. Every morning he would work out, he would work all day long, and then he would eat a healthy meal, and then he would come and spend the evenings in the hospital with me. I was in the hospital for 17 days. I had seven days of chemotherapy, my tail infusion, and then IL-2, which gave me a combined stomach and respiratory flu, um, headache, rash, fluid in my lungs, rigors, hiccups, and the world's most public period, because I was on my period, of course, during that, um, that time, and I ended up requiring a blood transfusion because I had no platelets, and it was just a um, very scary time, and thankfully, I, I made it through. My favorite part about my time in, in Pittsburgh was um, I came up after going to IR and getting my first port that I had ever had, and it was a triport. And when I came up, um, Nick was waiting for me in my room, and he said, "Let's see it." And I was like, "Oh, you would like to see my nipple tassel? This is my my nipple tassel. Um, it landed right on my boob, and um, was something. Anytime a nurse came in and wanted to access my port, I would correct them. So we branded ourselves the Incredibles. Our last name is Doble." And I decorated my hospital room like a dorm room. Um, I had my crystals, my diffuser, a yoga mat, my fuck cancer cross stitch, and my own pillow and my own blanket. And when I came home, I wrote down everything I packed and I made it into a blog because I think that's also one of, one of the hardest things as a cancer patient as you pack for these trips that are nothing like the kind of trips that we're used to taking. And one of the things that we, that really stands out to us about UPMC is the way they treated Nick. Nick said to me once early on in, in our journey, he said, everybody always asks how you're doing and nobody ever asks how I'm doing. And it just it killed me to hear him say that. And at UPMC, they saw him like he Dr. Kamula would come into the room and he and it was, hi, Katie. Hi, Nick. How are you both doing? And when he would talk to us about what was happening, he looked at both of us. And when the nurses would come in and say, Katie, do you need more ice chips? Nick, can I get you an orange juice or a soda? They just they really took care of him. And, and Nick finally felt seen. And so I think it's important to remember that this isn't just my journey. This is this is this is my family. We are all in this. And if they weren't holding me up, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be able to go to these appointments. So it's important to recognize those people as well. Um, so we left Pittsburgh and we waited. <laughs> and since it was COVID and I was bald and Halloween was, appro uh, Halloween was approaching, I decided to have a little bit of fun with my baldness. And so these are pictures from what I recreated while I was bored at home. And over the course of the next year, Dr. Kamula made it possible to administer all of my scans um, at UC Health. And so this saved us thousands of dollars. Um, and throughout the year, we saw I, my tail activity was still very high. Some tumors were disappearing. But this one tumor kept growing. And Dr. Kamula kept calling it the festering problem. And I quickly deeply regretted not including Uncle Fester in my lineup here, like very much a missed opportunity. And so I, I named the tumor Uncle Fester. And in September of 2021, Dr. Kamula, um, after a scan, said to me, you know what, Katie, I actually want to surgically remove Uncle Fester. And I was like, great, I'm on my way right now. <laughs> and so um, Nick and I went back in September of 2021 to Pittsburgh and I had a major surgery and half of my liver was removed. And when I woke up from that surgery, we heard the words we once thought impossible. Katie, we got it all. You are no evidence of disease. <laughs> this was two years and two months ago and I remain no evidence of disease. And Dr. Kamula, thank you. Dr. Kamula continues to monitor me. Um, I'm pretty sure I was supposed to be done with the trial by right now, but he's like, no, 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 we're hanging on to you as a patient, and, and that's, that's where I would love to be anyway. So I know that I am so lucky to have my dad. I am so lucky to have incredible doctors, apart from Dr. Doom. <laughs> 
And all of these humans, these, these my why, um, these people who have been holding me up, um, Dr. Hovland, it, the one who named me the um, zebra corn, is currently writing a paper on me. And I learned in reading this paper, one of the things is I've never actually Googled my disease. Um, and I just don't want to see these really crappy statistics that I know I'm going to see. And so when I was reading this paper he wrote about me, I, I saw some statistics. And one of them was that there's a one, there was a 1% chance I'd still be standing here today when I was diagnosed um, back in 2014. So the work that you are doing for my community, giving attention to rare cancers, um, I, I cannot thank you enough um, for everything that you do for us. Um, and that is all I have for you today. I do, um, if you scan this code, um, it will link to my Huffington Post article. Um, please link in with me. I'm a friend hoarder. I met Nick on LinkedIn. I'm a recruiter, headhunter by day. <laughs> So I do a lot of um, patient advocacy posts on LinkedIn, and that's my favorite way to keep in touch with people. Um, but yeah, I will be around all day, and if you have any questions, um, just feel free to come up and ask. So thank you.